Uh, thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? All those people at the back checking your email. I just want to make sure you could ignore me nicely. Okay, so uh, my name's Nicholas. I'm a, a recovering Python programmer, um, and I'm going to tell you the story of Mu, uh, which is a code editor which uh, I've been involved in helping to write. Uh, I used to be a school teacher. Um, that will uh, become relevant as the talk progresses. Uh, and uh, the Mu editor is, I guess, a further expression of my passion for all things educational. Um, so what exactly is Mu? Well, uh, as it says, Mu is a code editor for beginner programmers. Uh, and this talk is, I guess, a sort of a who, what, how, and why sort of a talk, uh, where I try and answer those four questions. Um, and I'm going to, I guess, tell you some of the gory details as well about, about this story as well. Um, so, uh, first of all, um, who on earth needs yet another code editor? Well, um, Microbit, Microbit did. Um, so, if you're not aware, uh, the Python Software Foundation were a partner uh, with the BBC Microbit project, and I was involved in that. And uh, one of the things that we needed to do was create a Python IDE for a browser. And being the good software developer that I am, I hope, I went and asked uh, the folks that were using this uh, browser-based editor what they thought of it. And whilst they acknowledged that being able to use Python in the browser and uh, getting MicroPython and things working from, uh, from uh, that medium was kind of convenient, you just point a browser at a, at a URL, you couldn't get things like a REPL and uh, uh, it was a bit of a pain in the neck because when you wanted to get the MicroPython onto the device, you had to click a button, then download a thing, then work out where the thing was, and then drag it over to the thing, and then it would go syntax error at line 10, and you'd go, oh, God, not again. You have to go through the whole rigmarole. So um, the Mu editor was born. This uh, is a very simple um, code editor uh, that complements the uh, browser-based ID that I created for the Microbit project, and this uh, and Mu was itself a sort of a PSF contribution to that. Um, interestingly, nobody really asked the teachers or the students what they wanted, um, so this is something that I started to do as well. Uh, so, hey presto, uh, one Sunday afternoon when I'd got the, all this feedback about you know browser-based editors and things, uh, I asked myself, well, <laughs> how hard can it be to write a code editor? I mean, you know, uh, and so um, and so we were off, and Mu has since grown uh, quite a lot since then. So, uh, let's just think about this. Um, often tools for uh, developing software are written by software developers for software developers. Um, and I want you to try and imagine what encountering these tools might feel like for a beginner programmer. And by beginner, I mean not necessarily a child. Uh, it could be an adult who's coming to coding for the first time. The fact that you're laughing and I've not even started my sentence tells you a lot about, uh, about what I'm about to tell you. This is uh, sort of, there are two extremes, I guess. There's the uber minimalist editor. Uh, this is uh, Vim. Um, <sighs> I'm a Vim user and I'm waving my arms like this. Um, and to a beginner programmer, how does this look? Well, it's a big red danger button. There's only one thing, you know, but, but what does it do? There's no feedback. Um, it, it's hard to know how to engage with this, uh, uh, let alone make it do anything useful. Um, the alternative is the sort of maximalist approach. Um, so uh, this is, uh, I mean, you're a beginner programmer. Where do you type the code? <laughs> what do all the buttons mean? Uh, what's all the information? This is information intimidation, okay? Um, and I guess, it's the sort of uh, IDE version of a 747 flight deck. I think that might be the space shuttle or something like that. Okay, there's just buttons everywhere. Now, as power users, we either know all our Vim key bindings, and uh, I just saw Tiago's talk uh, next door using the turtle model, and he was on fire. Um, there was like code flying all over the place, and it was a joy to watch this. You know, Tiago is obviously an expert VI user, uh, or your sort of uh, um, your IDE has all the buttons, and you know exactly intuitively what each of these things mean, and you can kind of grok the code as you're typing it and things. But you're a beginner programmer, and uh, this is intimidating. 
So what could we do? Um, one way to overcome this problem is to simplify, um, but we have to ask ourselves, what do we simplify? Um, and some people simplify the code. Okay, so uh, how many of you are familiar with uh, what's currently on the screen at the moment? Okay, so that's actually uh, less than I thought there would be. This is Scratch, which is a, um, a graphical programming language, and what you do is you move blocks around, and then when you click the play button, the, the little kind of cat goes on adventures. Um, so he'll, like a turtle, he'll move forwards and rotate 90 degrees, or you can flip him, or you can say if he's collided with this strawberry, then make a squelch sound, or something like that. Um, uh, that's simplifying coding, though, because I'm sure that many of you wouldn't want to write a website using Scratch, for instance, uh, or PyTorch, or something like that, you know. Um, so um, this feels to me like it's simplifying, and that's a good thing. You can get basic core concepts of programming through to children uh, in, a, in a wonderfully visual way, you know, loops and things like that, um, but it's not the real thing. Um, and the reason I mention the real thing, uh, this is Alan Kay. Uh, how many of you have heard of Alan Kay? Okay, oh my gosh. So Alan Kay is sort of, I don't know, one of the gods of programming language design. He, he invented object-oriented programming, basically. Um, I read this quote from an interview a couple of years ago, and the line I want to bring your attention to is, uh, is, the, is, is, is at the end. Um, and this is his approach to uh, trying to create tools for beginners. Um, the idea is you never let the child do something that isn't the real thing. But you have to work your ass off to figure out what the real thing is in the context of the way their minds are working at that development level. And he also mentions, well, other complicated skills that people have to pick up um, do similar sorts of things. He talks about sport, he talks about music, which is something I'm passionate about. I've been on the receiving end of, of a music education. So this really spoke to me. So um, is this a case of, rather than simplifying programming, could we simplify the tools, is the question uh, that we're asking. So uh, Mu is a Python editor for beginners, and it's the real thing, okay? Um, so. What do I mean? Uh, what do folks need when they're beginner programmers? Um, so we took the rather unique step of uh, actually um, collaborating with lots of beginners and teachers and asking them what they wanted, as well as being programmers ourselves. We used our kind of uh, sixth sense uh, developer spidey sense to go, well, do you know what? They're asking for the moon on a stick. And actually, because we're professional developers, we kind of know the trajectory where they're, they're going. And so perhaps we can help guide them. Um, we know where they are, and we know where they're probably going to end up. It's somewhere around here. So how do we get them uh, to where they need to be? Um, so what we want to know is uh, what exactly do we need to implement in an editor to help a beginner programmer access a real programming environment in a way that's not intimidating in some sense. Um, interestingly enough, we all seem to have opinions about editors. Um, and uh, I've been on the receiving end of all sorts of interesting feedback about Mew as a result of this. Uh, it's not only just the VI versus Emacs. There's all sorts of uh, interesting um, commentary about what should or shouldn't be in an editor. But the important thing is that our focus isn't on us as developers, or what does a developer want, it's what does a beginner want. So we're asking ourselves, do we have the empathy um, to uh, appreciate what our target user base uh, needs? And so what do we do? Well, we, we obsess over user feedback. Um, and I regularly go into schools, and I observe teachers teaching Python. So this is a teacher doing perhaps the most teacherish thing you'll see all week, um, pointing at a whiteboard that's had Mu projected on it. And I go and observe lessons. I watch uh, beginner, young beginner programmers uh, try and struggle with Mu, um, and we get to see what the bumps in the roads are and things like that. Um, and I also teach Python as well. So I use Python with, uh, with older beginner uh, coders as well, uh, and this is what happened at the beginner's day at Europython on Tuesday as well. We, we were all using Mew to make funny, goofy cat games and uh, web servers and things like that. Uh, it was rather nice. Um, so we need to try and work out what are the real features that folks like this teacher and his students need. Um, well, we need to meet these users halfway. So I'm going to give you an example. So this is the 
uh, debugger. Um, the GIF is halfway through running. I'll tell you when it starts. OK. We're going to start again now. OK? So you can drop a breakpoint in. I click debug. It hits the breakpoint. I can do simple things like step over. Notice there's only a few buttons. These are the core things that a debugger actually does. Um, you've got a place that's not a new window, uh, so you're not losing your, your uh, code running behind other things, uh, where you can type things in. You've got some sort of an inspector going on, but it's really, really very simple. You can step into other functions, okay? So you're getting these notions of how do I use a debugger in a, in a, in a visual, graphical sort of a way, okay? So the important thing is, is that when you next go, when you graduate from Mu to uh, perhaps that second sort of editor with a, with a graphical debugger, you've got these concepts already from Mu. Mu has only introduced these concepts with four buttons, and they, it, we tried to make it as clear and obvious as possible what these things do, okay? Um, so this is uh, maybe training wheels, um, to borrow one of Dan Pope's uh, phrases. Uh, it's training wheels for the tools that we use for programming, okay? So you then go and use VS Code or PyCharm or whatever the latest kind of editor hotness is, um, and that has a debugger in. These sorts of concepts become familiar. Uh, are already familiar, and you've uh, got the context, the cultural context you need to be able to engage with those tools and then fly as a, as a new developer. Um, so we do, we do this a lot with all the different features uh, that we, we have in Mu. So we have uh, simple versions of all sorts of different things where we try and make uh, we try and make the buttons represent particular concepts, like flash to a particular device or upload to a web server if they're writing a, um, a website, things like that, okay? Uh, another thing that we do um, is that uh, we try and meet um, our users halfway uh, when it comes to language as well. Um, one of the things that I did whilst I was researching Mu was try and work out, well, we're in Europe, uh, we have lots of uh, languages, um, but Python is an English language, um, uh, programming language. And um, how do, say, for example, French teachers um, address this? And the feedback that I got when I was in, in Paris, uh, speaking to a whole bunch of um, French teachers, um, I mean, French teachers of programming, not teachers of the French language, if you see what I mean, um, uh, was that kids get that Python is English, but there aren't that many keywords that they need to uh, have to learn. So if, else, else if, that sort of stuff. It, it's not a problem. But what they do have a problem with is the fact that the tools that they might be using are also all in English, and they might not have the English literacy skills to be able to access those tools properly. So uh, we made certain that the interface for Mu could be very easily translated. Um, you, uh, type a command, the, the thing comes up, you translate it into whatever languages it is you want, and then you create a pull request for us, and it comes back. And so this, uh, this is French. Uh, I particularly like the French translation um, because all the, uh, well, well, many of the words uh, actually sound like the English equivalents, but with a funny French accent, the way they're spelt. So it's not a debugger, it's a debugger. Um, <laughs> I also like the fact that uh, to zoom in and to zoom out is zoomer and dezoomer. Um, and this reminded me of my um, failed attempts at learning French as a student. Um, and you know, in French, they have uh, ER verbs and IR verbs and RE verbs. And it just got me thinking, uh, je zoom, tu zoom, il zoom, nous zoomons, vous zoomez. And you're sort of <laughs> doing all this sort of stuff. Um, uh, anyway. Uh, we have lots of different translations. Uh, Chinese is quite popular because uh, we have lots of users in China. Um, and so it's wonderful to see this as also a way to engage with the community of developers who are out there. Uh, if you are a developer from somewhere or other um, and you want to contribute, one of the first things that you could do is if your language has not been translated, uh, it, it has not been used to translate Mu, go make a translation for us. If it has already, then uh, go check it as well. Um, I have to admit, 
Uh, when I take these pull requests, uh, I, again borrowing from Dan Pope, um, I kind of check a few of the Google, uh, a few of the uh, translations in Google Translate, and if it sort of approximately uh, is is what I was expecting, then I go, well, that's probably all right because you know I'm not a Chinese or Urdu speaker or something like that. Okay, so we we do check. Um, okay, so. We meet our users halfway in terms of their accessibility needs as well, is what I'm saying. And when I say accessibility, I don't just mean language skills as well. Um, education is for everyone, okay? Um, we can't exclude people from taking part in education. It's not like you can say, well, programming, it's just for the kids that, uh, that are enthusiastic or something like that. Everybody should be given an opportunity to learn to program. Um, so our software should be inclusive, um, and accessibility is the key to this. Now, again, uh, part of the research for Mu involved um, working with uh, the chap you're about to see. I have a video for you. Uh, he's called Ben, and he's a software developer at the BBC, but he is blind. Okay, And uh, some of the things that we've been doing is that we've been... Um, reaching out to uh, communities of learners who might have, in the UK, we call them special educational needs, uh, which means that they might have some uh, aspect of their life which means that accessibility to um, common, regular uh, educational resources is, is a bit of a challenge, okay? So uh, reaching out to these folks to actually ask them, well, what would work, okay? It's important to put these users, uh, to give these users a voice, okay? So, uh, I'm just going to play this video, um, and if I can find my pointer, uh, and move the video back, there's Ben. Um, and you get to learn all sorts of fascinating things that I, as a software developer, would never have even thought of. And this is a great example of this. It doesn't impact Mu directly, um, but this is a rather wonderful thing to learn from a, a blind developer. Yeah, we're, we're working on me, and um, this is uh, this is a standard Windows uh, machine um, uh, that's running a screen reader called NVDA, which is open source. It's actually written in Python, so it's uh, it's fairly appropriate for this Fantastic. one. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so, so, yeah. I think seems we're working on me. How about how about we we run me, and we'll, uh, okay. we'll we'll see we'll see what it says. So I'll just type. Um, so I've, I've cheated. I haven't even see. I haven't even used autocomplete for you. So I'll press enter. And that was it. So okay. So why is it going? What, what, why is it sounding? What's going on there? So so that was that was talking. Uh, <laughs> So that doesn't actually sound that fast to me. That sounds just a, a little bit faster than uh, human speech. Really? Wow. Yeah. So that just sounds just, just probably like anecdotally probably sort of less than 20% faster than the speed that you're talking at then, wow. I feel to me. Uh, Would you believe it? <laughs> um, so <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is that uh, if you ask your users uh, or help them to tell their stories, you'll learn all sorts of interesting things. Um, another uh, interesting uh, version of this story is that uh, teachers, when they are presenting, um, when they're using things like Idle or, uh, or other professional programming languages and you've got people sat at the back of the class and they're losing attention and things like that. And why is that? That's because they can't actually see the code on the screen. So one, two of the buttons that we have, well, as you know, in French, they're zoom in and dézoomer. Uh, we, we have zoom in and zoom out. And these are used an awful lot as part of the sort of... Uh, using Mu as a pedagogical tool as well. And the first time I showed this to a group of teachers... Um, and let's be honest here, making things bigger and smaller is not a difficult thing to do uh, with the GUI framework that I'll be talking about in a moment. Um, they were like, oh, how did you do that? Because what they were used to was, well, you've got to go to edit, then settings, and then font size, and then scroll down a bit, and then you have to kind of guess what the numbers mean. And if you do it in the 20s, it might be, oh, no, 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 that's too big. Okay. So... Um, that said, break in five minutes. Okay. Okay. So um, I'm going to speed up then. Um, so the important thing is that uh, we've put our users at the center of um, our, our development. Um, so how on earth did we build Mu? 
Well, Mu actually is only 4,000 lines of Python. It's a relatively small project. Um, it's a modal editor. Um, I'm a VI user. Um, so uh, this allows us to simplify the user interface an awful lot. Uh, we have 100% test coverage. Um, as well, and uh, we've tried to automate all the things. So when we submit to master, uh, within about five minutes, we have a Windows installable and a, an OS X installable and all that sort of stuff ready to go. Um, so the most interesting aspect, I guess, that you uh, might be interested to hear about is what's it like doing cross-platform GUI? Um, so there are several options that we could use. Uh, there's TK Inter. It's simple, and it comes with Python. Um, uh, but it looks like it's from the 1990s, which of course it is, uh, and it doesn't work with screen readers, uh, so the accessibility doesn't work. Um, BlueX Windows uh, is a cross-platform native-looking GUI um, uh, toolset, but at the time we started new, there was no Python 3 support, um, nor was it actively maintained, although this has now changed. Uh, GTK, um, well, which one? Two or three? Um, they're kind of cross-platform, but uh, Raspberry Pi only supports GTK2, and Raspberry Pi being an educational machine is something that we particularly wanted to target. Um, and it doesn't particularly look native on Windows and OS X. It looks like a Linux application. Um, so we looked at PyQt, again, native-looking, cross-platform GUI with everything but the kitchen sink. Um, but again, we have the Qt4 or Qt5. Um, actually, PyQt itself is a shim around the C API, so it's kind of a non-Pythonic API. Um, and it also includes Qt versions of absolutely everything, okay? Um, like threading and so on and so forth. So you could go the Python way or the Qt way. Um, so actually, what we did is we made a Faustian bargain with, uh, with PyQt, okay? Why is it Faustian? Well, um, PyQt unlocked lots of features. So we could use the Qscintilla widget, uh, which is a very mature code editor type widget that we could use, uh, but uh, it has a, um, a very complicated C API that, uh, honest, um, I spend hours just trying to figure out what the documentation is going on. A lot of experimentation there when we're trying to be debug that. It has a cross-platform look and feel, but then teachers told us, actually, we want it to look the same um, and neutral in all the different uh, UIs uh, that, uh, that we use so that any of the resources that we create will work on OS X, uh, Windows, and so on and so forth. Um, it needs to, it has accessibility for all, so it's got a good, uh, good support for uh, OS's um, built-in accessibility, except the screen readers are brittle. So uh, it appears that um, certain screen readers um, do or don't, depending on whether it's a Thursday or not. Um, so uh, getting a screen reader to work is hard. Um, uh, we also get a Qt console, um, uh, which gives us an IPython REPL as well. Um, thanks to Thomas Cliver for that. Um, but that starts to pull in IPython now, and we started to get packaging creep as well. Um, so Mu is starting to get bigger and bigger. Um, and then, of course, we come to how do you package Mu? Uh, I love this. Uh, this was from the open spaces in PyCon US uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, packaging is great and fun, and there are never any problems. <sighs> if only that were the case. Here's what we do. Okay. For Windows, we use something called Pinsys, uh, again, by Thomas. Um, it's super simple and actually has the advantage of really working, uh, whereas other options didn't for various complicated reasons. Complicated because it would take two or three weeks to actually go through all the rigmarole of trying to work out why the damn thing didn't work. Pinsys just worked. On OS X, use Beware's briefcase. Again, the same sort of thing happens. Uh, if you're not aware of, uh, of Beware, they do some amazing work, uh, and, and, and Russell and all the others um, do an amazing job with that. Their documentation is fantastic. Um, for Linux, <sighs> Just buy a Debian maintainer a beer, or get him drunk over a curry, or get her, uh, if, you know, get a Fedora developer and, and, and you know, get her to say yes to, uh, to, to package this thing for you. Uh, this takes a long, long time, okay? Um, but it has the advantages that if you um, have the upstream uh, package in place, then everything else sort of uh, eventually catches up and it filters in. Uh, PyPI, Mu is, uh, is, is installable through PIP. Um, that's the easiest way to get uh, Mu installed on, on your computer in a virtual env if you are a Python developer. Um, and of course, like I mentioned, uh, all the installers and everything are automatically built by continuous integration as well. Um, so um, why? Are we, I've got two minutes left. So why are we doing this? So what we are trying to do is um, 
creates a programming culture. And uh, uh, I want to use a musical metaphor. So a beginner is like this young lady with her violin entertaining the local cats. Um, at some point, uh, Nicola Benedetti, concert fiddle player, didn't know how to play the violin and was entertaining the local cats. Okay? So how do musicians get from this to this? Or this. This is Ali Beale. He's a folk, a famous folk fiddle from from, Orkney, uh, from Shetland. If I say he's from Orkney, that's uh, that's terrible. Um, or maybe this. We're getting a whole bunch of violinists to work together. Or how do we get that little girl to maybe just playing the fiddle in her local pub, amateur kind of uh, um, folk music? Or maybe I don't know. Even this. <laughs> Who knows? The important thing about music is there are lots of different cultures uh, going on, and um, the violin is the tool that gets you into that particular culture, and the violin allows you to find your level in that culture. Not many people end up being a concert violinist, um, but rather a lot of people enjoy playing the fiddle in the pub when it's their sort of local folk session. So Mu, to me, is sort of like a, a violin. It's like the instrument that we're helping people to uh, come to not music, but coding, and then when they become competent at Mu, they can graduate away to PyCharm or Visual Studio Code or some of the other editors that you see out in the, in the hallway. It's a graduation process, okay? If you're using Mu professionally, you probably shouldn't be doing that. And I'm the Mu author, and I'm telling you, you shouldn't be doing that. You should be using something professional, okay? So what are we doing? By making Mu in a certain sort of a way, by being explicitly open source, uh, we're demonstrating a certain sort of programming culture. Um, so this means that Mu is also the means of passing on such a culture as well. Okay? Not only is it the tool that lets you code, by the way that we develop Mu, we're demonstrating that culture too. Um, and that culture is open, collaborative, supportive, all the things that we hope the Python community to be. And then so is Mu. Okay? We take great pains of trying to be a welcoming community. So my call to action, this is my last slide you'll be relieved to hear, um, is, is simply this. Uh, education um, makes our future possible. It's, uh, and what that future is depends on who turns up to provide such an education or provides the tools for that education. Um, so uh, my call to you is don't just sit there, do something. And that's what we're trying to do with Mu. That's it, the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, we do have a couple of minutes for questions, uh, if you have any. There's microphones in the aisles. Hi. I heard you were talking about MicroPython, if you're uh, like working on it yourself as well. If I heard correctly, you are using MicroPython yourself? Uh, yes, I use MicroPython. I was just going to ask whether Mu help, uh, helps with uh, like deployment and uh, remote debugging, or is it not included in this? Uh, deployment with... to MicroPython devices and debugging, remote debugging. Yeah. Does it involve, is it involved in Mu? Yes, so Mu was originally created for the MicroBit, mm -hmm. which was a MicroPython based device. It also supports any CircuitPython based device. Mm -hmm. Adafruit, who make CircuitPython and provide a whole bunch of funky boards, um, uh, they contributed a large part of the CircuitPython mode. So there's a, micro, there's a MicroBit mode, there's a CircuitPython mode, there's also an ESP mode, which works awesome. with MicroPython on those chips as well. But remember, this is beginner focused. So okay. we, we make it easy for you to do those things, but as a power Python user, you might go, okay, I see how Mu's doing it, and I'm gonna go back to VI or Emacs or PyCharm or whatever it is you're using. Super cool, Okay, Thanks. cool. So there's less of a question, more of a ask. Mm -hmm. How do I get an editor like this in the browser that we can ship on mybinder.org? <laughs> so, um, I obviously wrote the Python editor for um, the Microbit project, and that's browser-based. Um, and it looks similar to Mu because I fed a lot of the feedback I got about Mu, I fed back into the browser-based thing. So there are editors out there that are browser-based. Um, one, the, one of the things that I would say is that connected to the REPL, which is an important aspect of learning, um, you know, live coding, being able to make blink, things blink and so on, um, in the MicroPython world anyway, is, uh, is hard because, you know, uh, web browsers and USB serial and things, there is an API, but it's quite flaky. I've managed to get it working on Chromium. Um, 
but not on Firefox, except sometimes it works on Firefox, but then it doesn't work on Chromium and, and blah, 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 blah. So I think the state of the browser ecosystem is not mature enough yet to be able to go, okay, here's a beginner's IDE that we could then package using something like Electron or something like that. But thus making the packaging story a lot simpler. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the problem with Binder is lots of people use it for workshops and education. Yeah. But we give them like Jupyter Notebooks or VS Code. Yeah. And that's, well, the professional tool. Yeah. And it would be great if we could have an editor but that that download me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Is that it? Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thanks, Nicholas.